Great. Okay. Thank you guys so much for coming. This is so fun. It's still novel to me when we all get in a room together after COVID. Um, I've used my notes, but I've got such luminary speakers that I need notes on their biographies. Um, so I'm Natasha. I'm the arts and ecology curator at Dartington. I've had the pleasure of producing Ferment. Um, so it's been a really fantastic few months and weeks just being absorbed in the process of fermentation of all different kinds. And one thing that I've really come to realize is that Dartington is its own kind of fermentation because it's the center isn't it, of transformation. And we bring all these unlikely ingredients together and at its best, it cultivates new cultures. So that has been a really exciting connection for me. And I hope that you guys are experiencing that too. So I'd like to introduce Sandor, who you'll see on the screen, Sandor Katz who calls himself a fermentation revivalist. New York Times has called him one of the unlikely rock stars of the American food scene. Uh, his prize winning book, The Art of Fermentation became a New York Times bestseller. Probably all of you in the room know all these things. He's an, absolutely, an absolute superstar in the field. He's taught hundreds of workshops all over the world. So maybe some of you have even taken them. And we're very lucky to have Colin Pawson here as the He's the head gardener at Schumacher College. He's been there for four years and he's program lead as well. He teaches a six month practical residency where they grow all the food for the college and the estate. We've got his wonderful growers here in the front row. So I'll give them a little shout out. Um, so they're gonna be in conversation, hopefully across all the whole spectrum of fermentation from soil health to gut health and everything in between. And we're very lucky to have at the end with us, Eva Bacchuslet, who is an artist, a curator, a gentle activist, and filmmaker. And she's really inspired by the process of fermentation. She explores it in her film. She explores it in different methods of, of workshops and social sculpture, film, really everything under the sun. She's got an incredible breadth to her practice. And she began her fermentation exploration here at Dartington at Schumacher College, partly with Sandor. So we'll hear more about that at the end. So thank you everyone very much for coming. Welcome Sandor and Kwam. Thank you. Okay, hello. Hello, Ka thank Colin, you, I Oh, okay, great, you're still. You go first. No, 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 I, I thought you were muted, but you're- Oh no, no, I've got this special it. mic here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be interviewed here tonight, Sandor. It's one of the things I love at about working at Schumacher is I get to meet or maybe virtually this time some of my heroes and you're definitely one of those heroes. Um, and being a gardener I'd like to start with vegetables. Um, so in your new book you talk about how vegetables are were your gateway into fermentation and I was wondering if you could talk about how you got into fermentation and suggest a good place for those to start who are new, new to it. Uh, sure. Um, since you just mentioned my new book, which is about to come out in a few weeks here, let me show people. It's called Fermentation Journeys. Um, and it focuses on fermented foods and beverages that I have um, learned about in my um, um, travels since I've been doing this uh, 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 fermentation revivalist work. Um, and, you know, as, as you, as uh, uh, you know, vegetables were my gateway into fermentation. Um, but uh, I mean, I would say that my, my interest in fermentation developed in several distinct stages. Um, you know, as a kid, I loved pickles and I'm, I'm still making the kind of um, uh, uh, fermented sour dill pickles that I grew up with. Um, uh, you know, I wasn't watching my grandmother make them or anything. We were buying them in a delicatessen, but for whatever reason, I was very drawn to this lactic acid flavor of fermented vegetables. Uh, I didn't know it came from fermentation. I didn't know anything about it. I just loved this flavor. Um, when I was in my mid twenties, I spent a couple of years following a macrobiotic diet and macrobiotics places a lot of emphasis on the digestive benefits of pickles and other live ferments. And um, well, I started incorporating pickles and other ferments more regularly in my diet. And I also started observing that whenever I would eat these pickles that I had been eating my entire life, 
I could feel the salivary glands under my tongue squirting out saliva. And in a very um, tangible way, I began to associate, you know, these foods with getting my digestive juices flowing. Um, but still, I wasn't making them myself. I was, you know, buying them in uh, natural foods, grocery stores or delicatessens or, or whatever. And, you know, the impetus for me to investigate how to ferment myself is that I moved from New York City, where I grew up to rural Tennessee, where I've been living for the last 30 years. Um, and started keeping a garden. And I was such a naive city kid when I moved that it never had occurred to me that in the garden, all of the cabbage would be ready at about the same time. And all of the radishes would be ready at about the same time. So, you know, when I first encountered this, you know, pretty obvious reality of agricultural production, um, you know, I decided I should learn how to make sauerkraut. We had a nice row of cabbage the first year I was gardening. And I knew sauerkraut had something to do with with preservation and i looked in um the joy of cooking which is this sort of you know uh, uh a very common uh encyclopedic american cookbook and it had a recipe for for sauerkraut and i couldn't believe how simple and straightforward it was and it was so delicious and you know then i started experimenting i you know well what if you put in turnips as well as uh, a cabbage what if you use carrots you know what if you play with the seasoning and i and i learned how you know versatile the process process was and then I branched out into other realms of fermentation but you know the reasons why I generally recommend vegetables as a place to begin a fermentation practice is number one it's very very easy shred vegetables salt them season them however you like them pound them a little bit or squeeze them until they get juicy and then stuff them into a vessel so that they're submerged under their own juices it's incredibly incredibly easy you don't need any special starter culture i mean you certainly could make kombucha uh, um you know you you certainly could make koji i mean there's all kinds of things you can make that aren't that hard but a lot of them you need to find specific cultures and to ferment vegetables you don't because uh, uh, lactic acid bacteria bacteria, um, you know, are believed to be present on all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth. So the, you know, the starter cultures are already there. You know, the third reason is you can enjoy your results relatively quickly. You know, if you want to make soy sauce, you're going to have to wait a year to, you know, enjoy the fruits of your labor. If you ferment vegetables, you know, you could wait a few days, a week, a couple of weeks, a month, if you like it really strong. Um, but, um, uh, you know, the lengths of time we're talking about are not extremely long. You can, you know, in, in, enjoy the, the, the fruits of your labor relatively quickly. And the final, you know, reason why I think vegetables are the perfect way to start is that, um, you know, for many people who have not been, um, you know, directly personally involved in fermentation, the idea of cultivating bacteria in a jar is terrifying. And, um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're one of those people who's worried about it, and you're gonna like, you know, stare at your jar of fermenting vegetables and wonder, how can I be sure I have good bacteria growing in there and not something dangerous as so many people do. Well, I mean, I can just tell you that there are no um, uh, case histories of illness or food poisoning from fermented vegetables. It is among the safest foods we know. It is safer than raw vegetables. Statistically, fermented vegetables are safer than raw vegetables. You know, we, we hear every year of, um, you know, kind of, uh, um, uh, um, um, outbreaks of food poisoning, uh, uh, salmonella or, or, or other forms of food poisoning uh, uh, from uh, fresh fruits or vegetables. You know, one year it was lettuce, one year spinach, one year tomatoes, one year apples. I mean, clearly there is the possibility of, you know, contamination in the field or, or, or in handling, um, you know, but if you fermented uh, uh, vegetables that had been exposed to some sort of incidental contamination like that, well, the, the indigenous lactic bacteria will dominate in the fermentation environment. And as they acidify the environment, they will knock out the salmonella or the other food poisoning organisms. And it's just very convenient for us that acidification is such an effective strategy for food safety. So, you know, in, in terms of anyone's like, you know, nervousness about fermenting because they're projecting a 
anxiety about bacteria or other microorganisms onto the process, you know, vegetables are just as safe as it gets. And there's just, you know, no case history anywhere of, um, uh, uh, you know, illness, food poisoning or other related problems. That's fascinating. Thank you. And, and, and in recent years, there's been quite a big um, resurgence in interest in fermentation. I mean, I, I've been making kefir myself for about 10 years. And I remember when I started, um, there was no one knew what I was talking about. But now that you can buy it in the supermarket shelves, I just wonder what you think is behind that, that big change. Well, I mean, okay, so I mean, if we use the example of kefir in the UK, you know, that was something that was fairly um, um, obscure that has become well known, but it, you know, it's not as if fermented foods and beverages were unknown in the UK. I mean, um, you know, certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, bread, beer and cheese, um, you know, would be three, um, um, you know, obvious ferments that have been, you know, really prominent in the diet of people in the British Isles for centuries. Um, and, you know, what I would just say is that, you know, fermentation has been, um, you know, in recent centuries and millennia in recorded history, fermentation, you know, is and has been prominent in culinary traditions in every part of the world. You know, it's uh, fermentation is simply an essential aspect of how people everywhere make effective use of whatever food resources are available to them. And, you know, I would say that in our great grandparents' time as much as in our time and in their great grandparents' time, times, um, uh, you know, fermented foods and beverages have been prominent. Now, you know, I, I mean, one aspect of it is, you know, as, you know, globalization and more, you know, people moving to different parts of the world are bringing different traditions with them. So that's one aspect of it. But, um, you know, I would say that, you know, one of the, you know, narratives of the 20th century is of, you know, fewer and fewer people being directly involved in the production of their food in any way. And so, um, you know, even if fermentation has remained prominent, um, you know, fewer and fewer people you know, were practicing it or um, um, observing it. So it became more and more mysterious. I mean, how, you know, any kind of food is made is really uh, mysterious to, 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 to many or, 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 or most people. Um, the things that are changing, I would say that there are two things that have changed, you know, that have made people more aware of fermented foods and beverages and have brought a greater diversity of foods and beverages, um, um, you know, into the marketplace and especially into, um, you know, mainstream supermarkets and places like that. And these two things are number one, the microbiome. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, in the you know from the from the uh, uh, earliest awareness of bacteria in the late 19th century through the 20th century, um, uh, you know, we lived through what I would describe as the war on bacteria, and um, you know, people became very fearful of bacteria, and we kept eating all these fermented foods and beverages, but you know, nobody was wanting to think or talk about the the bacteria, and I would say, you know, beginning around the you know the the the, the the uh, uh, 90s sometime when um, uh, the Human Microbiome Project was, uh, was published and publicized, you know, people have become more aware that bacteria are not just these pathogens that have the potential to make us sick, but they also are, um, um, you know, a critical part of us that, you know, every healthy human being is host to, you know, more than a trillion bacteria, just mind boggling numbers. And, you know, we're becoming more aware of the services that these bacteria provide for us and how, um, um, you know, intimately tied our health and well-being is to the health and well-being of bacterial communities um, in and around our bodies, most prominently in our intestines, but, um, uh, you know, really uh, uh, in many other locations of, of our bodies as well. And, you know, they enable us to effectively digest food, they synthesize nutrients for us, a lot of what we call 
all our immune system is the work of these bacteria. Um, and, you know, we're learning more and more about how they, you know, regulate a lot of our body chemistry, including our brain chemistry. So in a way, the health of our gut bacteria um, uh, has implications for, uh, you know, how we think and how we feel um, because they're regulating brain chemistry and many other aspects of our physiology. So I think more and more people have become aware of the strong connection between the health of uh, uh, the communities of bacteria, you know, in our gut and elsewhere in our bodies and our health and well-being. And so people are seeking out bacteria-rich foods, um, you know, really in order to restore biodiversity in the gut. And, you know, the reasons why we have less biodiversity in the gut than people in the past is, you know, because of processed foods and we're eating less fibers and we have all of this um, um, exposure to chemicals that, 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 that end up uh, narrowing the range of bacteria that can live in us. So, um, you know, restoring biodiversity is, is generally a good thing. And one way that people do that is by eating fermented foods and beverages. And so there's, you know, be, just become greater interest in fermented foods and awareness of the process of fermentation because of that. And then the other reason is I, I mentioned earlier how, how, you know, fewer and fewer people are directly involved in, 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 in food production. Well, um, you know, for my, for my you know, grandmother's generation and my mother's generation, I mean, it was a miracle to not have to, you know, be involved in directly producing, you know, all, all these things and to be able to get, go to the supermarket and get everything in one place. And, um, um, you know, it, it, it represented liberation. But I would say that, you know, for, for, for my generation, you know, these mysterious processed foods in the supermarket have, you know, come to represent less liberation and more, um, um, you know, sort of, a, you know, mystery. Um, and, um, and, you know, people are concerned about their health and want to eat foods that are going to support their good health and, you know, want to understand, you know, where their food came from and how it was produced. And, you know, I think that, you know, once people begin uh, interrogating their food and asking questions like, how was this made? Um, uh, well, you know, fermentation is just part of the answer for an incredible range of foods that we eat. And I think that this general interest in, you know, where food comes from and and how it was made has also reinforced people's interest in, you know, this specific process of fermentation. Thank you. And, and perhaps leading on from that question, um, I, I once heard you say that fermentation created us where, rather than us creating fermentation. I just wonder if you could explain what you meant by that. Uh, sure, sure. I mean, <clears throat> so, if you talk to a biologist about fermentation, a biologist understands fermentation uh, uh, to be um, anaerobic metabolism, the production of energy without oxygen. And, uh, you know, most of the foods and beverages that we describe as fermented are these anaerobic processes that meet the biologist's definition, uh, even if a handful of them do involve oxygen. And, you know, I think of these as the oxymoronic ferments. Um, but, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, before you know, if we think about, about, uh, about these things in a long-term um, evolutionary time, per, from a long-term evolutionary time perspective, then, um, you know, long before our atmosphere had oxygen, which could support forms of life like us, you know, the earliest forms of life were these uh, archaea and bacteria that were um, uh, 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 functioning anaerobically. They were metabolized, that they were fermenting. Um, so, um, uh, you know, there were you know, billions of years of, you know, fermentation by archaea and bacteria before, you know, there was the oxygen that could support forms of life like us. And, 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 and of course, you know, evolutionary biologists, you know, largely agree, you know, that all life is descended from these earliest life forms of archaea and bacteria. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's simply just, a, you know, a, a, a factual statement that, um, um, you know, we emerged out of this sort of, you know, long line of, 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 of evolution that, you know, began with these fermenting organisms. Um, uh, you know, and of course, you know, the, 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 
you know, increasingly uh, uh, evolutionary biologists recognize that, you know, it is from a union of fermenting organisms that we end up with um, these more complex life forms, eukaryotic cells that, that, that are the building blocks of multicellular beings such as ourselves. Um, and, and, and so, you know, really it's, it, it is the sort of joining of these um, prokaryotic life forms that from which all all eukaryotic multicellular life uh, uh, emerges. Yeah, it's fascinating. And there's, there's, it also brings up questions of where we begin and where they start. And yeah, what, what is an individual? Yeah, yeah. And you, you've, you, sorry, we could go on. No, no, go ahead. And yeah, um, alongside this um, increasing understanding of our gut biome, we're also understanding how important soil life is for growing healthy, nutritious crops. And, and, and one of the best ways we, we support the soil life at the college where I work is we, we make compost, which is, I think, a very similar sort of fermentation process to making something like kimchi. Um, and and I, just, I just love the idea of, 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 of the, uh, the way we look after our soil and our gut being very similar, and that all, that sort of th all comes together and, and bring everything together. And I'm just wondering how you, where you what do you think about the, the link between soil health and gut health? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the soil is just where it all begins. Um, so, um, you know, the, 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 the soil and the bacteria and fungi and other organisms of the soil, um, you know, really have a big role in, you know, the health and well-being of plants. And, you know, we can't sustain ourselves without, uh, you know, without these plants that, you know, are really dependent on bacteria and fungi in, 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 in the soil. Um, you know, and of course, um, uh, you know, food can be, you know, sort of more nutritious if it grows out of soil with the right biodiversity to, to enable that. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's just, it's, it's just a full cycle. You know, the bacteria in our gut and the guts of every other uh, uh, type of animal come from the soil just as the, you know, microorganisms that, that sustain the plants do. So, uh, you know, I think that the soil is where it all comes from and also where it all returns to. Um, and, you know, the reason why we don't have, um, you know, heaps of, uh, you know, bodies and uh, uh, trees and plants um, uh, littering the earth is that, you know, we all decompose back into the soil and, you know, we feed this, you know, web of soil organisms that, you know, really, you know, are, 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 are major, are, are major factors in, you know, sustaining life on this planet, including us. So, so I think it's a very intimate connection, and I and I have met some um, microbiologists who are doing very interesting work where they're you know going to different farms, testing soil samples, doing microbial analysis of the soil, and then taking tissue samples of plants grown out of that soil, and then fermenting some of the vegetables grown out of that soil to try to understand in a more nuanced way how the biodiversity of the soil um, um, is reflected in the biodiversity of, um, of the plants and the ferments that we make from them. And then the biodiversity of our gut flora as a result as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and alongside this resurgence in fermentation, um, you, and you write about this in your book, actually, we're, we're still seeing governments and corporations campaigning to undermine the consumption of these sort of traditional projects, products and, and fermented things and so on. And I mean, I like to think as when I'm making my own fermented food, I'm, I'm playing my role in fighting that in a small way. I, mean, I just wonder if, there, if you've got any thoughts on how we can help those who are struggling to protect their, their food culture from this attack. Well, okay. I mean, first of all, I would say that there are, you know, long traditions of, of um, uh, you know, I mean, particularly colonial governments, um, um, uh, you know, either outright 
uh, outlawing or creating, you know, kind of outrageous um, rumors about traditional uh, uh, fermented foods. Um, you know, I've spent some time in uh, uh, Colombia, in South America, and in Mexico, and in both of those places, um, you know, fermenters talk about these sort of campaigns um, by by, by breweries, and then, you know, because the breweries were such a, you know, kind of major um, uh, 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 um, economic power, you know, they would get government support to try to convince people that indigenous fermented beverages such as chicha in Colombia, and such as pulque in Mexico, um, you know, are, you know, they're, they're trying to convince people that they're unhygienic. And only, you know, sort of modern factory produced beer is the hygienic alternative. So, I mean, I think that there have been, you know, long standing, um, um, you know, campaigns against traditional fermented foods. And I think, you know, in our in our current context in, um, you know, in the UK, in Europe, in the US, uh, in Australia, uh, uh, probably in, in, in lots of other places, um, you know, we see a a lot of misunderstanding. Um, um, you know, I, I, I mean, personally, I don't think that there is sort of like a concerted, um, you know, sort of effort by the, you know, health regulators to um, um, uh, stamp out traditional food production. Um, you know, I think it's more that um, uh, regulations are being developed that support the sort of generic notions of mass production, which end up making a lot of traditional production impractical. So for instance, uh, you know, I'm very familiar with, um, you know, U.S. restaurant uh, uh, health regulations. And, you know, the, 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 the general principle is any food that has sat out um, um, between in Fahrenheit, between 40 and 100, fo so in, in uh, Celsius, that would be between like, you know, five degrees and uh, uh, 60 degrees, um, is just intrinsically uh, uh, dangerous to eat uh, if it's set for more than four hours in that temperature range. And that would describe just about every fermented food and beverage sits for more than four hours in, in that temperature range, and it's not dangerous. And so, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, we need to be challenging these standards when they are, you know, disallowing traditional food. So, um, you know, there's, 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 there's no beer that anyone is drinking anywhere that didn't sit in that temperature range uh, for more than four hours. There's, um, you know, there's no traditional bread that anybody's eating. And I say traditional bread because, you know, until the 20th century, their yeast didn't exist as a separate thing. You know, yeast was, you know, an organism found on wheat and rye and other grains along with bacteria and people had techniques for sort of cultivating that into a starter that could rise bread but it was a a, a mixed culture and it takes a little bit longer but but you know anyway you know traditional bread could never be made in in you know less than a four hour period so you know all of these things you know yogurt you can't make you well you can make yogurt if, if you know if, if you get to precise the right temperature you could make it in a about two and a half hours, but you know, most yogurt is made for longer periods of time and it gets much more delicious if you leave it for a long, much longer time. And, you know, to the extent that you might be concerned about lactose and want to eat yogurt with lower lactose, the longer you leave it and the sour you let it get, the less lactose it's going to have. So, so, so anyway, you know, I, I just think that a lot of these standards, um, uh, you know, they might be fine for many or most kinds of food production, but they really are unsuitable for, um, for fermentation. So it takes people willing to, um, you know, challenge the rules, challenge some of the logic behind the rules and, you know, really make the case for the, you know, safety and effectiveness of um, uh, uh, traditional um, food processes. Um, and, uh, alongside this, this resurgence I was talking about with the fermentated products um, we're also seeing a resurgence in growth and interest in what we call land race varieties of food which are, are varieties of food that are bred to be suited to their particular 
landscape or a growing environment, we've been starting to create these sort of varieties at, at Schumacher College. And um, for instance, I, and I've seen my wife's sourdough culture that she makes actually change when we move house because of the wild yeast and the other microbes in the different houses affect the, the quality of the bread. And it, it really um, fascinates me this way of food can be really very embedded in its, its locality. Um, and you often talk about how food is intertwined with the people and the land around it in your books. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about the ways we can deepen our relationship with our food and our landscape through fer fermentation. Well, sure. I mean, you know, fer fermentation just just brings it all together. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, the organisms that are going to be on the food that you're fermenting have to do with the specific place where it was grown. It has to do with soil microbiology. It has to do with what's around it, what's blowing through the air, what are the climate conditions. Um, and then all of that is magnified by the environment where you are fermenting. Um, so, um, you know, and any product of agriculture, any, 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 um, you know, any of the plants and any of the animal products that make up our food are populated by these elaborate communities of organisms, never by singular organisms. You know, this idea of like, you know, a packet of pure yeast or a starter of, you know, pure Aspergillus or Rhizae to make Koji, you know, these are 20th century inventions. They are, you know, they are technological. Logical. The organisms themselves are biological. Yeast is everywhere, but yeast is never alone. Yeast is always found, you know, with other kinds of organisms. You know, all of our food is host to many different organisms. And so, you know, the big practical question with fermentation is which of these organisms are going to grow? And that has everything to do with environment. And so, you know, if you're making the sourdough in a, um, you know, in a, in a stone building that stays pretty cool, it's going to function very differently than if you do it in a space that's very warm. So, you know, temperature and humidity have, have a role, but then the building itself can, you know, can hold organisms. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, there, 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 there have been stories of, of, you know, buildings where people were making some kind of ferment for, you know, very long periods of time and having a certain experience. And then, the operation has to move to a different building. And sometimes they have a very different experience because, you know, the organisms that they've been working with over time in the same space can really accumulate in the space. So, um, you know, I, I mean, fermentation is the ultimate in, um, uh, you know, localized foods, you know, having a very specific experience in a very specific place. And, um, you know, I mean, in the winemaking industry, they, they talk about that as terroir, the terroir of the grapes, you know, the, the soil, the weather conditions that sort of give the grapes their particular quality that's then magnified during the fermentation of, you know, the, 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 the qualities that the, you know, particular location gives, gives to the ferment. Um, so, I mean, I just think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's integral to, to, to fermentation, this idea of, 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 of place. Now that's not to say that if you move into a different house or a different apartment or to another city or to another continent, that you can't carry on the tradition you were doing, but you know you are going to have to sort of um, alter your technique inevitably because you know something will be different about the about the new space. And so I think that you know the one other factor for people who are practicing fermentation is just a big piece of it is observational skills, just you know noticing what's different and then you know sort of trying to. Um, uh, you know, trying to respond to the differences appropriately, because I mean, you really can ferment pretty much anything pretty much anywhere. Um, but sometimes it's a matter of working out like, what do you have to do a little bit differently in your bread making process? Like, you know, oh, maybe you have to alter the timing a little bit. And of course, one place is never going to be always the same. I mean, in terms of, you know, temperature and humidity, you know, everything's always changing. So, you know, you get used to one way of doing things, and then the season starts 
starts to change and, you know, you, you have to observe the changes and, you know, potentially alter, you know, how, how you're doing them, the length of time you're fermenting it or, you know, some, some aspect of it. Thank you. And it's also interesting how those, those um, contact with place can affect us in similar ways. I remember reading about those studies done on genetically identical twins uh, were born by a cesarean and they were held by two different nurses. One twin would then grow up to be quite slim and the other one was growing up to be quite overweight. And that was purely based on the, the microflora around those two nurses and they took them on and then their gut flora was influenced that for the rest of their lives. So it's, it's fascinating those interconnections yeah. between plants and soil and gut health and food and everything. And, um, and that sort of leads on to the next question I had for you. And it, this, we often have a bit of a, this, this disconnect we talk about with our food in the West. And, um, and it, go, it goes much deeper than how the food's made. I mean, through the rituals that you describe in your book, we can see how people of our land maybe have connect, may have connected with their food in something deeper in the past. Uh, and I, there's a quote that I got from there where you, you said, Fermentation traditions do not exist in a vacuum. They are manifestations of relationships with the land, with plants, with spirit, and with ancestral traditions. And I love the way you describe people as dancing around a ferment to teach it to dance. That, that idea sounds brilliant to me. And at, at Schumacher College, we, we try to take the time to celebrate the changing of the seasons and, and the land and the food that we grow, sort of to recognize that. But I just wonder if there's a way we could include fermentation in, in that way of Sort of reconnecting with our lost traditions and perhaps maybe making new traditions as well. Well, I mean, yes, I, I, absolutely. And, you know, and, and how can we not? Um, but um, I mean, I would say that if we, if we, you know, sort of think about a lot of the language we use and we look at some of the, you know, sort of, um, um, you know, traditions that, 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 that people do practice, you know, when, when, when people come together, they break bread. Okay, that's you know, breaking bread is how we talk about sharing food. So bread is a product of fermentation that we have, you know, in, into which we invest, you know, um, 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 you know, sort of quite, uh, you know, qu quite a bit of, in, of importance. Um, and, you know, bread is a way of, you know, sort of like, you know, elevating, um, uh, you know, what we can grow into something that's, you know, much, 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 much greater than that. And that's what we share with people when, 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 when we share food and, you know, and, and wine or, you know, any kind of alcoholic beverage is something that we, uh, um, you know, associate with ceremony and celebration and, um, uh, you know, in the, in, 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 in the, in the Roman Catholic mass, you know, it's not a random substance that transubstantiates into the blood of Jesus Christ. It's, it, it, you know, it's wine, you know, so we do invest a lot of symbolic importance into some of the products of fermentation. Um, and I think that, you know, certainly in, in creating, um, you know, new rituals of appreciation, new rituals of marking the season, you know, we need to, you know, we, we, we need to incorporate a, a, a fermentation into these. I mean, a, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of indigenous traditions have, you know, in, incredible amounts of, you know, ceremony, um, uh, you know, just in, in their lives in general and marking the transition of seasons, but also in the production of, 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 of fermentation. So, you know, where you quoted, you know, from one of my books, you know, me talking about, you know, people dancing to teach the ferment how to, you know, how, how, how to dance. I mean, that's, that's one way that, that, that people do it. There's not just one way that people do it, though. There are other ways, you know, other, other cultural traditions have approached it in exactly the opposite way, where, you know, they, 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 they do the fermentation in a place where people won't be running around and making noise, and they have the idea that it needs stillness, it needs quiet to do its thing. So it's not that there's, you know, just one um, uh, ceremonial approach to fermentation. Um, you know, there are a lot of, you know, different specific ways that people have approached fermentation in a, um, a ritualistic ceremonial way. But it has been very common, you know, in indigenous traditions, you know, through the Roman Catholic Church, um, um, you know, to invest symbolic 
uh, um, you know, importance in uh, uh, the products of fermentation. Yeah, and it's, it's good to be reminded that sometimes something as simple as eating bread together can be a, a ritual in itself. And we, yeah. we always have bread together at the college at lunchtime and, and it can seem like a mundane thing, but actually it, it can be quite magical in itself as well. I don't know whether you saw in the chat box there, but my wife just sent a message saying she's currently making sourdough bread at home while she's watching this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So um, less of a chore and more of a dance with life. Yeah, that's wonderful. And yeah. I mean, I have, you know, Catherine, I have just talked to so many people who, um, you know, just feel like feel like that about bread making in particular, just that it's, um, um, you know, it is this this very like nurturing process that they end up feeling like they they get a lot out of. It's not, you know, it's not just like a job, a chore. It's 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 something that they look forward to, that they invest a lot of meaning in, um, and that they feel a great deal of pride about. And and do you think by um, connecting to nature and the landscape in a different way through food? especially from a place of gratitude, that there is hope that we can learn or start to take better care of our planet. Well, yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I would say that, um, you know, I think that, it, you know, it's not that I think that, um, you know, people, um, uh, you know, being more aware of food, participating more, more in growing food, producing food is necessarily going to, um, you know, sort of change our relationship with our environment. But I think that it is necessary in order for us to change our relationship with our environment. I mean, you know, in a very tangible way, anything related to producing or procuring food requires us to interact with our environment. Our food is plants and animals. And so, you know, if the, um, you know, if food is more than a consumer experience of going to the supermarket and making decisions based upon how much money you have in your pocket, um, um, you know, if we, if we take, a, take it a step further, I mean, the food we eat is about plants and animals that, you know, either we or somebody else is interacting with. And I think that, um, you know, it, it would be it would it would be a very radical change if, you know, everybody in the world had to have something to do with interacting with plants or animals in order to eat and survive. And I think that, you know, that simple act would force people to just be more in tune with their environment, to, you know, notice things more, to um, uh, uh, be more invested. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, it's profound. And, and I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's not a question of, you know, everybody having to fend for themselves and, um, um, you know, feed themselves with their own wit, but, you know, if everybody could just make it a project to produce, you know, grow a few plants to eat, have a tiny little garden outside their house, it just forces us to, um, you know, be more in tune with the environment directly around us and um, um, uh, be more invested in, in the environment and, you know, pay more attention to, you know, the, the, the national and global um, uh, uh, issues and, and debates. So, so I think that, that food production is actually very, um, you know, a, a very profound part of, um, um, you know, where hope in the future lies. Mm. Yeah, and, and it's fascinating. I've, I've seen studies done on, on using children and, and those that don't have contact with green space and spend most of the time on, on, in concrete and tarmac and those who have contact with green space will do much better academically than the ones who don't. So there's a whole myriad of it, it, things that would also go on that would feed in from that, that reconnection with nature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and, and I mean, kids are the most important ones to introduce. Kids are the future. And so, you know, I'm, I'm inspired, you know, when I meet people who are involved in school garden programs or, you know, other, other kinds of programs to, you know, just get kids interested in, you know, where their food comes from and how it's produced um, um, and fermented. I mean, I've done some wonderful workshops with kids and, and um, you know, a lot of people have the have the notion that like just children won't like the strong flavors of fermented foods. But um, I mean, sure, if, if, uh, you know, if, if, if you introduce sauerkraut to a nine-year-old who's never tasted it before, they will probably have a, um, uh, uh, kind of a squeamish response to it. But if they've been eating it since they were one or two, they won't at all. They're, you know, I mean, I've just seen so many very small children just loving the sour flavors of fermentation. Um, um, and then, you know, when, I, when I've worked with kids to make it, once they have their hands in it, they're dying to eat it. And every day it's, when can we eat it? Is it ready yet? And, uh, you know, the hard part is having the patience for it to develop. Mm. Uh, I've, I've heard you talk about your diagnosis of HIV and how fermented foods have helped you to, to stay well. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about this and how you think your experience could be useful in the current situation we find ourselves in with COVID. Well, OK, I've become much more cautious about the way I talk about this. So, I mean, I was I, I uh, tested HIV positive um, 30 years ago and um, uh I wrote on the back cover of my book, Wild Fermentation, that um, uh, uh, fermented foods have been an important part of my healing. And, um, and a lot of people extrapolated from that very vague statement that I had uh, uh, cured AIDS with uh, uh, fermented foods. And so, I mean, I just need to be clear that, you know, I've been taking antiretroviral drugs uh, since uh, 1999, so more than 20 years. But, you know, I, I mean, these it's not like you take drugs or you uh, 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 try to um, um, sustain yourself in a healthy way with food, including fermented foods. I mean, whatever treatments you're, you, you might be pursuing, you're also eating. And, um, you know, I will say that most of the people I've met who take the kinds of meds that I take have digestive problems that I've never had. So I really attribute my, my um, ongoing digestive health to eating fermented foods. And I think that it's part of my, um, um, you know, general well-being. But you know, also, also I've been on meds for all these years. Now, in terms of COVID, I mean, I would say, I mean, since, um, you know, since last March, I've had people emailing me and asking me if um, uh, fermented foods uh, 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 prevent COVID. Now, I have to say that's just magical thinking. You know, I mean, for someone to think that like, you know, eating sauerkraut would necessarily prevent COVID. And then for someone to think that like, I would know as a fact that fermented foods would prevent COVID just seems like magical thinking. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I understand people's desire for magic bullets and solutions. And although fermented foods and beverages, um, you know, really can be part of a, you know, sort of overall, um, uh, um, you know, plan for healthy living, the more people say it prevents specific things or or cures specific things. I mean, for me personally, I, I just am very skeptical. You know, once I encountered a website that said, if you drink kombucha every day, it will reverse the aging process and prevent your hair from going gray. Well, I mean, look at my hair. It didn't look like this when I started doing this work 20 years ago. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, I definitely have not had kombucha every day, but I've probably had kombucha, you know, as, as many days as I have not had kombucha over the last 20 years. And, um, and still somehow I have aged and, um, you know, my hair has turned gray. Um, uh, you know, I would like to imagine that I'm, you know, I'm aging gracefully, I feel energetic. Um, um, but, you know, the, 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 you know, no, no food you eat is going to reverse the aging process, you know, time marches on. Now, in terms of COVID, I mean, sure, we can extrapolate and we can decide that, um, um, you know, foods that are supportive of overall immune function might make it less likely that we would 
um, um, you know, get sick with COVID if we encountered it. Um, so, I mean, sure. I, I mean, I think that, you know, eating fermented foods and beverages has very general benefits. You know, they can potentially improve our digestion. They can uh, uh, potentially improve our immune function. Um, you know, and they can potentially, you know, improve our brain chemistry, but that doesn't mean that they can solve all of our problems or protect us from every danger. So, um, so yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's, a, I think it makes sense for people to, you know, I mean, at all times, not only in COVID times to, you know, sort of, you know, eat a, um, you know, a, like, a, like a varied diet with lots of different kinds of vegetables, um, uh, you know, eat lots of living fermented foods. They're, 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 they're wonderful. They, you know, they, they promote, uh, uh, um, uh, improved immune function, improved digestion. Um, but it, you know, I would say also, you know, wear a mask, um, um, you know, pr protect yourselves in the, in the ways that, you know, our public health systems are, are encouraging us to. And I don't personally believe that, um, um, you know, fermented foods are, are, are any kind of like, you know, magic bullet to, uh, uh, prevent COVID. Thank you, Sandor. That's fascinating stuff. I think I need to um, bring in Eva now. Eva, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, hang on. Uh, I'm here. Hello. Hello. I think now's time for you two to have a conversation between yourselves. All right. Well, Eva, because I saw that you're going to be on here and we're going to be talking about Yona Schimmel. And by the way, at the Montana Fermentation Festival the other week, I met a man named Yona who was named after Yona Schimmel. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. That but anyway, so here is my... Here is here is a a, a jar of uh, of of my yogurt. This is a very well traveled culture that um, you know this this man Yona Schimmel, who has a conishery in New York on Houston Street, brought from Romania to New York around the 1860s. Opened this place. It's been in use for uh, 160 years now, and I wrote about it in my book. Eva was in New York, got some yogurt there brought some of it back and has been spreading it around uh, uh, the UK and Europe ever since. And then when Eva organized a workshop at um, Schumacher College right there in Totnes, um, she had some of this and I decided to try a method that I had read about where, and I took a little bit of her yogurt and I put it on a little, uh, a little square of cloth, left it in my window to dry. It got dry and crusty. I folded it up, put it in my luggage, brought it home, um, put that crusty thing into a jar of warm water, made a little cup of yogurt. And then, you know, for whatever it's been now, eight or nine years, I've been um, perpetuating it. That's, that is so wonderful. And that's exactly the way that that yogurt traveled with these immigrants who, who moved from Romania to, to the States all those years ago. And that is so, uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm fascinated by all these stories and, and about and also the, the incredible transformational power of, of the bacteria, of so being able to go into that dormant state, lie there, dry on a handkerchief, and then being revived, rejuvenated in milk on you know, somewhere else. And also the, this, this power of the, 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 the culture, the power of, you know, the, the, the importance of the culture, the, the fact that somebody cares so much about their, their fermented cultures that they, they just, and, and that they have to bring them with, with them. It's the same with the, the amazing uh, Vili that um, we've also, that I've also been working with, um, that I was inspired by, by your first book. Um, but yeah, this, this incredible, but there's, 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 uh, there's a new uh, chapter to, to the Yona Shimo, um culture because I've, um, I've, because I've been fermenting so many different things and uh, I've been spreading them all over the place. I've just had to rely on different people helping me to uh, cultivate the, the different things because I can't do it all in my kitchen. Um, it's, uh, it's impossible. So um, in England, this wonderful lady called Mandy Buckle, she came to one of my events in 2012 when I was living in England. 
and uh, she fell in love with the Yonashimal yogurt. And, you know, some people, they ferment, ferment it for a little while and then, you know, then they get onto something else and they forget all about it. But Mandy has been diligently fermenting this yogurt for since 2012. And whenever I needed, you know, to, to have a bit of this culture or needed to spread it to somebody because people write to me, then, you know, Mandy is there and she's, she's handing it over, sending it left, right and center. And um, when I was gonna, when I was asked to do this event, um, I got in touch with Mandy and normally she replies within two days and, uh, and yeah. This time she didn't reply and uh, it was really sad and I thought mm, something happened here and uh, I sent my luckily my I got a friend who lives in the same village and she cycled over only to find out uh, that Mandy had sadly passed away two months ago and uh, in the flat was her Mandy's son uh, Sam Sam had a quick look in the freezer. He knew about this yogurt and, and you know, he knew about, but he said, oh, you know, she's passed away two months ago. I might not be able to find anything in the fridge, but in the freezer, lo and behold, there was a, a pot of it. And uh, so it got resurrected, um, sent to um, a fantastic fermenter who was also with us, Sandor, in our event in 2014 in, in uh, in at Schumacher College. Uh, Rory Watts, who uh, is a, a wonderful fermenter, and she spent a few days cycling back and forth to the Dartington kitchen and, um, and you know, made this wonderful um, res resurrected yet again uh, yogurt from the Yonashima culture. Okay, well, that, that's, I mean, I'm sorry to hear about, about Mandy, but it sounds like her, her legacy uh, endures. Totally. But it's it's and it's lovely this this amount of care I think you know with with these heirloom cultures you know like the yogurts and the sardos and the you know the, the different milk cultures of course with with a with the uh, with the sauerkraut you just you just make it it's 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 there inherent in the in the vegetable but you know with these heirloom cultures you have to um, practice. Uh, a certain amount of care to keep them alive and you know the, the bigger the community the, the, the more of a you know the more of a resilience that culture will will have so it's uh, it's wonderful to have this this beautiful community of people who, who are fermenting it yeah 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 no and I mean I feel like we're so lucky to have heirloom cultures like this and you know just for anyone who sort of you know is like, well, there's yog yogurts everywhere. What's so special about this? I mean, you can make yogurt from any yogurt, uh, any alive non-pasteurized yogurt that you can buy. But most commercial yogurt is made with um, pure culture starters. And so um, uh, uh, in contrast to the um, heirloom cultures, which are these, you know, really... Uh, um, these evolved communities that have evolved a structure to support themselves over time. The pure culture starters, you know, I guess that they must be good for uh, uh, um, commercial production or people wouldn't be using them. But once you get down to the second generation, they're not as good. And the third generation, they're not as... I mean, so what happens is that they basically become diluted by random bacterial exposure as well as, uh, and, and um, um, the, uh, so there's been a lot of focus last year and a half on viruses. Uh, uh, it is believed that the most common type of virus in the world, which is the most uh, um, um, uh, numerous, uh, uh, you know, if you can call a virus a life form, the most numerous life forms on earth are phages bacteriophages. And these are viruses that essentially constitute diseases for bacteria. So in a, um, a pure culture starter, phages might start to attack some of the essential bacteria in the yogurt. Whereas uh, uh, in the um, heirloom cultures like this, for whatever reason that nobody fully understands the 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 the, the structure the the community structure of this evolved community is able to protect itself not only from random bacterial exposure 
but also from phages, which could potentially um, endanger, you know, any of the bacterial members of the of the community. So, you know, so the 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 heirloom cultures are incredibly resilient, and the reason they're not in more widespread use is that the early microbiologists were a little bit freaked out by their biodiversity, and they just like, you know, they wanted to pick out the specific organisms that were functionally necessary to make yogurt or other ferments and get rid of the others, never mind that, 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 that the structure of the community is what enabled the resilience over the course of you know, years, decades, lifetimes, uh, uh, and generations. And that is so fascinating and so incredibly, I, I, it just, it, it gives me a sort of Robin Hood-like feeling of, of taking back, you know, when, when you find an heirloom culture, like when I was starting to work with all these different ones that I've, that I've collected over the years, you just feel like you're, you're taking it back from this, uh, you know, this sort of homogenized um, um, society and, and bringing it back into where it should be and, and cultivating resilience. And and community, of course, because you have to. So it's uh, it's got well, and all those and carrying on these historical legacies because I mean a lot of these heirloom cultures, you know, have have just been lost, um, mm. um, you know, through through disuse, as you know, as as people who were carrying on traditions got you know seduced by the convenience of the supermarket and buying the commercial version uh, 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 instead of making it themselves. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting the way that these uh, cultures have been shared within their communities, you know, before they before they died out. And and I've done lots of interviews with people uh, in 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 North Norway uh, with this particular milk culture that was here, and and the culture, the fermented culture, kept um, the the society resilient. It kept them together. It sort of bonded them. So it's, it's had this function as well. And, and in, in Bulgaria and, and Turkey, I've had similar stories with the yogurt. So just, just this, uh, yeah, this gluing effect on, on, uh, on the community. I mean, it's also when you, when you look at it, you just think that you're sharing the same, you know, this, a, a similar uh, microbiome because you are sharing the cultures. So uh, the fermented cultures, which is, which is interesting in itself. You sort of gluing you together in that respect. So I'm also sharing in, in this um, event, I'm also um, sharing my uh, bread culture, which also started at Schumacher College. It was um, handed, I had a, um, a, a fermentation festival or a, or a celebration of bread festival called the Companion um, Festival of Bread in 2007, it was at Schumacher College. And we were, you know, um, there were lots of different people sharing bread cultures from all over the world. And Andrew Whitley, um, who's a former BBC journalist uh, traveling around Russia, uh, was gifted a, um, um, a bread culture from Russia and brought it with him to, to England and has, you know, cultivated it and spread it ever since and really revolutionized British bread culture. That was pretty dormant. So that's also being shared. Um, that's an old Russian revolutionary bread culture. So I urge you to bring a sample back home and become a part of that community. Thank you, Evie. I'm, I'm hoping to get a sample of both if I can take those home myself tonight. <laughs> so I think now might be the time to open up the floor to questions. We've got a room full of eager fermentists in here. Um, and Natasha has the mic. So does anyone here have any questions for either Sandor or Eva? And if so, could you put your hands up? Here we David down here at the front. Hi. Hi, uh, Sandor. Um, <clears throat> I think I read once that you, you, you were um, suggesting that we use Wade way to improve canned foods is that is that something you could elaborate a little bit on sure i mean <clears throat> I, I mean i'm not sure I, I mean maybe i maybe i said that in passing at at, at at some point but i mean okay so way is the 
like watery part of milk. And when you when, when milk curdles, you have a separation of the curds from the whey. And there are a number of different ways one can produce whey. And um, you know, some of the ways would involve cooking the milk uh, um, uh, in order to uh, uh, have a rapid uh, uh, acid curdling of it. And you know, if you make whey that way, um, then um, you know, it's not really full of live cultures, but you know, there are other ways of making whey. Let's say you make yogurt and then you drain the yogurt. That whey is full of bacteria. Um, you know, let's say you do a low temperature curdling of milk, that of raw milk, that's going to be full of bacteria. So, you know, um, 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 another writer uh, about fermentation, uh, Sally Fallon, who um, uh, is the founder of an organization called the Weston A. Price Foundation and the author of a, of a book called Nourishing Traditions, uh, 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 Sally Fallon has been an advocate of putting whey in everything. You know, Sally's sauerkraut recipe calls for whey. Um, and, and I mean, you know, I certainly have played around with starting things with whey, but mostly I've started things that were cooked with whey. So like, you know, I've, I've made what I call potato cheese, where I, you know, cook potato, mash the potato, put a little bit of whey in it, and then, and then it'll age in a beautiful way. Um, but, you know, whey can be a strategy for, you know, introducing bacteria into all kinds of things. So you could potentially do that with, with, with canned foods if, if, if you wanted to. Um, you know, I, I mean, I guess I should also say that, like, you know, I don't advocate using whey in sauerkraut. Um, I would say through the years, I've gotten 100 emails from people who read Sally's book and thought you needed to have a way to make sauerkraut. And then they didn't know where to find whey. They did, weren't doing anything with milk to make their own whey. So they went to the vitamin supplement store and bought the powdered whey for bodybuilders and put it in with their, with their cabbage. And, um, um, you know, it, 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 it gets a strange texture and it's certainly not introducing more bacteria. So not all forms of whey are the same. Um, if you want to use whey to, you know, bring live cultures into a food that, you know, where the bacteria have all been killed by heat, then, you know, you need to make sure you have it coming from something that is living and not something that's been cooked or, 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 or dried. But, but whey absolutely can be a strategy for fermenting or enlivening any kind of food that has been cooked or heat processed. Anyone else got a question? So as we're talking about um, cultivating with whey, I've been using kefir whey, I've been making the kefir cheese, and using the kefir whey um, with vegetables, which works really well. Um, I'm not very well read, but I was recommended that nine months was a period, and they do last for that long. Although I did some before the first lockdown, and it's and they still carrots still look like carrots, and you know everything. Look, but how long can I keep it for? Really, I, you know, how right. long? Well, should okay. It? How long always has to do with how warm or how cold. Um, uh, once I was visiting a farm in Vermont where they had a little business making sauerkraut and kimchi, and I ate some three-year-old kimchi that had never been in a refrigerator, had been in a cellar. So if you live in a place with a cellar that stays the temperature of the earth, your salty, acidic, fermented vegetables could last for years. I don't want to say forever, but you know they'll they'll they'll, they'll last for for many years. Um, you know, right here I have a jar. This is what I call radish kraut. It's made from uh, uh, radishes and a little bit of bok choy. Um, I have a 200 liter vessel that I filled up last November in my cellar, and um, you know this fermented all the way until maybe June. And by by June, my cellar, you know, the war, the air around here is getting really warm. My cellar is not staying earth temperature. It's warming up also. So this has been in my refrigerator since then. Um, but, you know, at refrigerator temperatures, salty fermented, uh, uh, salty, acidic fermented vegetables in a full jar will last indefinitely. 
Um, you don't have to worry if you find a jar, you know, buried in the back of the refrigerator that, you know, was there for three years, it'll, it'll, it'll be fine. Now, it starts to be a little bit different. If your jar is half empty, then you have a lot of potential for uh, a little furry growth, a little, little white growth to appear on the surface. So, you know, any kind of food that you're trying to preserve for a long period of time will preserve for longer if it's in a full vessel with a very limited amount of airspace than if it's in an empty, a half empty vessel with a more substantial amount of airspace. Um, and, and in terms of, um, you know, let's say your fermented carrots, I mean, you know, if they begin to degrade, what you will notice is that the texture is changing. The first thing that'll happen other than surface growth is that enzymes will break down the pectins and make what was a crunchy vegetable into a soft, mushy vegetable like baby food. And so if they get like that, I'm not particularly interested in eating them. It's not out of any danger. I mean, they're, they're certainly not dangerous, but you know, just, just in terms of like my aesthetic preferences, like if it gets that soft and mushy, it's just not appealing to me anymore. Um, and you know, if you're storing them at your sort of ambient temperature in the kitchen, at some point that, that will happen. So um, you don't have to worry about the safety of, of fermented vegetables. If you get any surface growth, remove it. The biggest, the biggest changes you're likely to experience are changes in the texture. And the way to avoid that is to keep it cool. I hope that answered the question. So I've also been experiment, experimenting with not using salt. And I do like, I like, I like the garlic. I mean, obviously it's nice crunchy and you can chop it up and put it in the salad, but I like the soft garlic. It's more like a roast garlic, you know, that nice. And, and the children like that. And also with eggs and when, and when I'm doing the eggs, the eggs are too salty. So, I mean, I might put a bit of chili in to make a bit of flavor or something, but um, so I, I've been doing fermenting without salt. And do you know about the, the difference in length of time with that? I mean, I understand about the keeping cold and everything. So. Well, so, I mean, the major issue fermenting without salt is that these, um, these enzymes that break down the pectins are inhibited by salt. And so the less salt you have, the faster they can become active. So, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge with, you know, fermenting without salt is, you know, keeping vegetables crispy and crunchy. And if that's not an issue for you, then it's not an issue. I mean, it's certainly not a, it, it's, it's not a safety issue. Um, a lot of times people work with um, other mineral rich substances that can, uh, you know, give some of the benefit of salt without, um, um, you know, have it without, you know, sort of giving you some of the, um, um, you know, problems associated with high salt consumption. So like, um, celery juice, celery seeds, other kinds of seeds, seaweed, um, you know, these are, these are all, you know, mineral rich, they have natural salts in them, um, but it's not pure sodium chloride. So, um, you know, one thing you can do is, you know, try to work with some of those kinds of elements. I mean, definitely the, you know, the best salt free kraut that I've ever had was made with celery juice where somebody juiced celery and poured that over the vegetables. And that was, you know, really, really excellent. But, you know, what I would say is whatever works for you, like if you like it and your family likes it, there's not a problem. Um, I mean, certainly I have encountered some health gurus who make the case that, um, you know, you get, you know, greater, uh, uh, you know, biodiversity, um, um, you know, potentially greater probiotic value if you make your sauerkraut without any salt. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I think that there are certain advantages to salt, especially in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the texture and the um, ability to store it for long periods of time without refrigeration. Um, but personally, I like very modest proportions of salt. I mean, most, you know, most people I've met who grew up in families where, you know, their grandparents were making kraut and learned how to make it from their grandparents they use a lot of salt because if you go back a couple of generations, like this is a survival food for most people who are making it. And, um, you know, if the vegetables you're fermenting are the last vegetables you're going to be seeing for the next six months, I mean, you have a reason to, 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 to use a substantial amount of salt if salt is accessible. 
Um, um, you know, I think for people today who are health conscious and know about, you know, some of the risks of, of, of over consuming salt, um, there's, and, and, you know, and who are not dependent for survival on these vegetables. I mean, I think using more modest amounts of salt, it makes sense and is, is smart for most people, but you know, whatever is working for you, there's no one way of doing this. And by the way, in Japan, a few years ago, I visited a um, uh, a, a town in a mountain valley that historically did not have good access to salt. And they have a tradition there of fermenting vegetables without salt. And what they do is they sit, they backslop, they save the juice from the previous year's batch uh, 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 to pour over the new batch so that um, they're basically pouring something that's already acidic and teeming with bacteria over. So it's so they get a much faster fermentation. And then they really only leave it at ambient temperatures for a very short time. And then they refrigerate it. But they've been backslopping, you know, the, I mean, in that particular village, they'd been backslopping for more than 200 years, um, um, you know, from uh, um, the, the fermented vegetables. Um, I, I, I read about this town in my new book, Fermentation Journeys. <laughs> Natasha, we've got a question here from Amelia. Hello, I just have Hello. a past question for all of the guests, Eva, Sandra and Colin. Just um, curious as to what currently or ever your favorite fermented thing to make and eat is? <laughs> I feel like this is a question that comes up almost every time. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, it's, I, I mean, I am extremely devoted to fermented vegetables. I, you know, I, 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 in my kitchen right now, I've got all kinds of different fermented vegetables going, lots of different styles. Um, and I love that, but I don't know if I love it more than I love cheese. I really love cheese. And I don't know if I love either cheese or, um, uh, uh sauerkraut more than I love, um, beer. I love beer and, and really like, <laughs> If someone tried to deny me coffee in the morning, which m many people don't understand is also a product of fermentation, um, I probably would trade all of those for a cup of coffee. So I don't know, it's hard for me to, 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 to pick favorites. And for me, part, a, a huge part of the appeal of fermentation is just, you know, how, how much crazy diversity there is. And, you know, not only can any food you can possibly eat be fermented, it can be fermented in many different ways and in, and in, infinite different combinations. So, um, you know, for me, my, my love affair with fermentation is really about um, um, the diversity. And I have a lot of like fleeting favorites, but, um, you know, my, my favorite is getting to try something new. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm got a very similar answer there. I couldn't live without coffee. And there's so, so many fermented uh, things I couldn't live without. But if, um, you know, with, with things I ferment frequently and things that I keep returning to, I mean, I, I, my bread and my kefir, I suppose, are my absolute best friends. I couldn't, I couldn't part with them in any possible way. And, and bread is, you know, I, I, I love baking bread. I love, you know, doing it in loads of different ways. And I've been baking sourdough bread for 15 years and absolutely, yeah, I can't, I can't live without that. And, and the kefir is the same. I just, my kefir is, uh, is a great friend. You know, we, you, you develop a relationship with these cultures and, and uh, you become friends. I mean, it's, they're inside you and they're outside you. And yeah, I talk to my kefir and my bread every day and uh, we, we're great friends and I couldn't live without it. Yeah, my, mine are the same as Eva. My, so at home, my wife, who's making it at the moment, makes sourdough bread and I make kefir. And we've the kefir culture that I have was given to me years ago by a friend. And Catherine's been making bread from that culture for years. And, it, and it's, it's that thread that takes us through all the different walks of life, a bit of continuity. And I love the story that Eva was talking about with yogurt, how it, it can connect us into our, our ancestors as well. And yeah, yeah so yeah, definitely my favourite. <laughs> 
Um, I'd love to show everyone like a new vegetable ferment that I've been working with. Um, <laughs> I met this guy in Australia. His name is Adam James. He lives in Tasmania in Hobart. And um, uh, uh, he had originally been interested in nuka, which is this sort of Japanese style of pickling in a perpetual bed of rice bran and, um, uh, and, and other seasonings. Um, but then, you know, he really wanted to make something that, um, uh, you know, he could make out of local ingredients. And so um, uh, what he came to get, he, what he ended up producing and taught me to make, this is a paste. This is a paste made of um, turmeric, garlic, and um, turnips, and a little bit of water and salt. And, um, you know, I started this uh, last November. So this is now um, 10 months old. And I just keep burying vegetables in and then leave the, you know, I, I've developed this medium for about a month. And now I just bury vegetables in it for a week, pull them out. I don't have any vegetables buried in them, but I just this morning thinning uh, daikons in my garden. I got two uh, 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 nice sized daikons and I'm just going to bury them in here. And so in about a week, these are going to be dyed yellow on the outside. When we, when we slice through them, they'll be like more brilliant yellow on the outside and then it'll taper off as you get to the inside. Like they'll have a sour pickled flavor throughout infused with the turmeric and, and, and the garlic. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, I mean, to me, it's a beautiful illustration of how people can, you know, take inspiration from one thing and then, you know, sort of twirl it into a whole different uh, 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 form. And, you know, while, while I would say that, you know, no one's really invented any completely new fermented foods or beverages in hundreds or possibly thousands of years, there's just a vast amount of innovation right now of people, you know, people experimenting in their homes uh, uh, and, you know, just coming up with, um, you know, exciting new, um, you know, combinations to try. And we can all be part of that, that, that innovation. Like, you know, I, you know, I, I end up writing recipes because people want recipes, but like, you know, take the recipe as like general inspiration and, um, you know, and play with it. And, and, you know, if you have something specific growing in your garden, you know, try substituting what you have a lot of, I mean, that that's really where, you know, all fermentation comes from is, you know, sort of people trying to figure out strategies to deal with, you know, whatever food resource they have, you know, a seasonal overabundance of um, so that they can enjoy it at some later time when, um, you know, they're facing some scarcity. Oh, we've got another question over there. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Doesn't matter. Um, hello, this is uh, just a question for Sandor. Um, I wonder if you could just say something about what attracted you so much to Tennessee. <laughs> Sure, sure. I mean, you know, Tennessee is an incredibly beautiful place. Um, but I mean, I was drawn to Tennessee by by people. But, you know, I mean, I met I met people who were. Um, who were part of a community at a moment when I was looking to make a big change in my life. And um, I was very intrigued by them. Um, I, you know, they talked about having a, um, you know, a queer community in the woods raising goats. And I just it had never occurred to me such a thing could exist. And I was intrigued and I went and I visited and I went back to New York and then a few months later I visited again and I and I asked like how would a person go about moving here and uh, I you know I, I I abandoned my career in municipal government in New York and you know moved to this commune in Tennessee and I, I don't live there anymore I mean I live a mile down the road um, um, uh, but I lived I lived in the community for 17 years and um, uh, 
you know, I mean, it, I, I wouldn't say that I love everything about Tennessee. You know, I live in a community where, you know, I, well, I live in a county where, you know, probably 30% of people have gotten vaccinated. Um, so, I mean, there, there are aspects of life here that, that I don't, that I don't love, but there are many aspects of life here that, uh, that I do love. And I love the, you know, I love the land here and I love the climate here and um, I love a lot of people here. So here I am. Hi, this is a question to Eva. Hi, Eva, it's Amanda. Um, it's um, very odd stepping back into Dartington Hall and nice to speak to you. I just want to, we're talking about abundance of vegetables. So how has it been um, in your garden um, this year above the Arctic Circle? What's abundant this year? And have you done some pickling and fermenting from it? Well, sadly, this year has been a disaster in my garden. Um, I've, I've still got some. I've got some cabbage. I've got some, you know, there's some garlic. I've got some bits and pieces of this and that. But uh, we've had a lot of rain, a lot of cold. This is a challenge of, of trying to grow as much food as you can above the Arctic Circle. And, you know, this, this summer hasn't been easy. And I've been very busy as well. And because of COVID, I didn't have the help that I needed uh, so much this spring. So, but I'm still, you know, I'm still got some kimchi going, there's some sauerkraut going, and, uh, but um, there's, there's not as much uh, as I would have liked it to be. But I've got an organic farmer who, who lives down the road and uh, well, a couple of organic farmers and she, uh, one of them grows veg uh, uh, carrots. So I get carrots from her and they are delicious this year. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, to um, and um, uh, and I'm fermenting from milk from uh, the organic farmer down the road. So I have to rely on the things that I can have and in bad years and uh, hope for a better year next year. Hi, are there any plant-based milks that work well for fermentation or is it mainly um, dairy milk that works well for that? Oh, you can definitely ferment plant-based milks. Um, well, I've been making, and I have a recipe in my new book, but um, <laughs> um, um, uh, I, I've been making something that I call kisil. And kisil is actually an old Belarusian name. Um, that I that I learned about that that these um, uh, uh, ethnobotanists who I met. Um, who were doing work uh, uh, documenting endangered and disappearing foods of Eastern Europe? Um, um, uh, you know, talked about the, the, the like what was in the past one of the most common ferments has almost completely disappeared, and that is the fermentation of oats. And, um, you know, I mean, the way that boxed breakfast cereal has become ubiquitous. Um, you know, before the 20th century, mostly that was people eating porridges, grain porridges. And, um, you know, for, for um, you know, infants being weaned off of their mother's breasts, this has been almost a universal practice around the world is fermented grain porridges. Um, so anyway, the way I make kisil is I, I take rolled oats, typically, um, cover them in water. Leave them like not overnight, not for a day, two days, three days, four days, like leave them a few days until they start to have like a, 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 some aroma. Then you strain it out. You have this glass of oat milk. You don't have to do anything. All it did was sit there on the oats and all of this starch makes it milky. It's, it's thick and white and, and has a beautiful, compelling flavor. So that's a fermentation of, 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 of a plant milk right there. It's like you've made the plant milk through the fermentation. And then you take the oats that have soaked for a few days, add a little bit of fresh water, cook them into the creamiest porridge that you've ever eaten. So that's a simple way to do it. You can also buy, um, uh, um, you know, 
uh, uh, soy milk or, or oat milk or any of these and make um, yogurt with them. Soy milk will tend to be the, you know, the, the, the thickest one that's most like a, a, a dairy yogurt, but the others will all, will all get flavor and, and, and ferment, even if they don't get a, a, a thick like that. But I mean, just like, there's nothing we can possibly eat, including plant-based milks that cannot be fermented. It doesn't mean that they're going to end up with exactly the same characteristics of, you know, cow or goat milk fermented, but, you know, absolutely they can be fermented and you can drink them in forms that are, you know, teeming with probiotic bacteria. Thank you, Sandor. I think, unfortunately, we're out of time now. But um, I'd like to thank you both for a really fascinating and inspiring evening. It, it feels a bit like we're in a big fermenting pot here and both with Eva's gifts that people are going to take out and the ideas that have been seeded and all the things that are going to come off. I'd love to track all the different things that we're going to, people are going to be inspired to do from this evening. But I'd love to thank you both and ask everyone to offer you a round of applause. And I'd just also like to add that I've been lucky enough to see an advanced copy of Sandor's book, and I do highly recommend going out there and buying it when it's released. Um, well, thank you, Colm. And, um, and Eva, what a pleasure to get to see you again uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this public forum. And um, thank you all for, uh, for your interest. And uh, I, hope, I hope that we have inspired you to uh, go home and uh, try your hand at something new. Yes, thank you so much. And lovely seeing you, Sandor, um, inspiring as ever. And uh, do go and date a bacteria on your way out. Um, you know, bring, bring home a sample of the Yona um, um yogurt or, or bring home a, a revolutionary Russian sourdough um, that um, is waiting for you outside in the hall. I'm, um, uh, yeah. Nice to see you all, or not see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.